I would like to welcome everyone to the Village Managers Candidates Public Forum. And I'm sure we'll have people coming in um, as we're going through this, but I wanted to go ahead and get started so we can stay on time. My name is Jalen Rowe, and I will be a co-facilitator this evening, along with Ryan Pearson. Our role is to contribute structure and process to this public forum so we're able to function efficiently. And as I always say whenever I'm facilitating, we need your help in doing that. As your facilitators, it is our job to create an atmosphere for each participant to be able to get their questions answered. And uh, a successful outcome for this evening will look like, and it will be that you get your questions answered, you get to understand the candidates management style a little bit better, and everyone learns uh, just a little bit more about each of the people that will be presenting to you today and vying for to be our next village manager. If we don't get to all the questions, I think we might. We have 20 uh, slots, but if we don't get to all the questions during the forum, there is ample time for you to ask questions, we're going to in the one-on-one -on -one, with the one-on-one -on -one candidate in our, and I call it our cookie reception, which will be held upstairs uh, immediately following. Okay, so don't think that that we're going to just cut people off because you will have that opportunity to um, to talk with the candidates afterwards. We do have a few housekeeping items. We have an announcement from HR. Uh, HRC, which is the Human Relations Commission. Tonight is the official unveiling of the Harmony Rain Barrel. The Human Relations Commission and the National Association of Mental Illness has worked together and selected a local artist, Sandy Sharp. Is Sandy in the room today? Sandy Sharp to artistically enhance a fully functioning rain barrel that conveys the message of harmony. You can purchase raffle tickets upstairs tonight during the meet and greet. There's also, uh, I believe, raffle, raffle tickets available at the front. Uh, the winning ticket will be drawn on uh, at 5 p.m. at the upcoming street fair. So if, if you're so inclined, please do so. All proceeds will provide mental health first aid and support the growth of NAMI's efforts. And it's really something that's kind of special happening in our community that's, that's worth noting. There is childcare available. And if you just go down the stairs, the first room to the left, I don't see any children, but maybe you've already dropped yours off. The restroom uh, is open, is down the stairs also, and it's located on the right hand side if you have to be for that. And I just have to say it, you know, it's common knowledge. If you have a cell phone, please put it on vibrate so we won't interrupt the speakers or the, the questioning that's going on. And last but not least, during the Q&A session, there will be a Q&A for the audience to speak. During the Q&A session, please wait until you have the mic in front of you because we want to make sure that everyone hears the question and this is also being taped to put up on YouTube, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Paul? Yes. And Channel 5. On Channel 5, thanks. Okay, a quick overview on how we're going to proceed this evening. Each candidate will have 30 minutes on the floor to speak to you. They will introduce themselves. They will give a little bio. You also have their bio in the programs that were passed out that you can read through. The candidates will answer six standing questions by the facilitators. Now these questions came from village members and they, they dropped in boxes, they emailed them in, they put them up on Facebook, and they were compiled down to these six questions. And then the, the um, now wait a minute, I know the name of this. The Citizens Advisory Committee, doesn't that sound nice? The Citizens Advisory Committee, they took them and they compiled them and 
they put them in, in, in this um, six question order. And then after the six questions, we will open the floor for the audience to ask questions. There will be numbers passed out. If, if we don't pass out all the numbers, the numbers are random. So we'll just skip and ask who has the next number if all 20 numbers have not been passed out. Um, we will continue asking questions until the candidate's 30 minutes is up. Then the next candidate will come up and we'll go through the same process. Is, is that pretty clear? Okay. And again, if we run out of time, please don't um, hesitate. Come up, get your cookies, ask your candidate what it is that you that we did not get to ask during the 30 minutes that they were here with us. Um, your input is truly welcome. So at the end of the forum, we have cards that have been passed out, two boxes. One says crate and barrel, and the other is decorated like a Christmas <laughs> gift um, in silver. So we have two boxes. Write your questions down. Not questions, I'm sorry. Write your comments down on what you're thinking, what you're feeling, um, what, what you got out of this. And please drop them in those boxes because the council members will um, go through those after the session this evening. The council members are really interested in our input, so please give it to them. Could I have each um, council member, if you're here, could you stand up? Because if you don't write a, a, a message to them, you can also call them, you can email them, you can talk to them at the reception afterwards. And um, we really ask that you do that. May I also have the Citizens Advisory Committee for the, um, uh, the VM search please stand as well. Because you guys played such a big role in getting this forum together and just getting information. So I'd like to give you a
take an active part in planning our festival, which is coming up next weekend. Um, it's a nonprofit organization that the village supports, and um, I take a very active role in planning that three-day festival. I like to do uh, fundraisers for a variety of causes. Uh, breast cancer awareness is one of my uh, most important causes. Uh, also educational opportunities, I believe, are important. So that's how I would also plan to be part of Yellow Springs, is to take an active part in those types of activities to help whatever organization might need help. Um, it, it, I think that's just and then, you know, one of the most important things you can do is help other people achieve their goals. And you know, you may have goals that I'm unaware of. Doesn't mean I'm not helping. You know, we're not going to have you ask your own question and have to answer it. Okay. You know, we've got a little more class. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, Ryan, our other facilitator, will go ahead and then you can. Well, I thought I hope you have answered this already because we were scrambling to get our questions again over here. But please tell us how you would promote the economic viability of the village. The first thing I would do is find out what available space you have in the village. Um, I know that you have some space available, some that already has a, a facility on it, and what you need to do is to find out what facilities you have, the square footage, what amenities they have, are they, are, do they have phone lines in, are they accessible to the highway, uh, those types of things. What vacant land do you have that can be developed? Then I would contact the Dayton uh, Development uh, Coalition because the Dayton Development Coalition is a direct line into Jobs and Bio. And that's how you fit your spaces and your needs to the companies that are looking for a place to form their business, to, to make home. And that would be the most important connection, I think, that you could make as far as economic development. Find out what you have and market it. Talk to the property owners, uh, work through that, ask them what they would be looking for in a renter, see what the, the village's vision is for that type of property, and then contact the Dayton Development Coalition. Okay, the number of black families in Yellow Springs is declining. How would you encourage engagement for people of color in our community? I did not come up with this question. It was actually <laughs> asked from the community. So if you could address that, please. Okay. Um, first, let me say that I would engage all of the different uh, aspects of the community and the way that I would do that is to contact the leaders in those, those different segments of the society and find out, find out why that, the, the black families are leaving, find out why that population is decreasing. Is it because of the lack of jobs? Is it because of the lack of affordable housing? Is it for some other reason that we're unaware of that we need to work on? Is it a service-related problem? You need to find out the reasons behind the decline and then work towards resolving that. And I would do that by engaging the leaders of the black community to try to help me connect with the families and find out why that is happening. Thank you. Social economic diversity is a community goal. How will you address the associated challenges? That ties into the economic development as well. Um, I know that two of the concerns that you have as a village are the lack of the moderate income jobs. You know, you don't, you either have the low end of paying or you, you have the high uh, pay jobs. But you don't have the, the middle class family type jobs. You also um, have a lack of affordable housing. And those are the two things that go, they go hand in hand. So if you can work with the economic development to pull in the types of jobs that would bring you those, those middle class uh, jobs that would help develop that type of socioeconomic diversity, then work on the housing problem. Perhaps you can give incentives for uh, mixed residential use developments, that type of thing. You, know, you don't have to have strictly a, 
a single family residential development. You can mix your, your development uses and your residential forms and give incentives for a developer to come in and do that and provide the different types of housing that other people can In the past uh, job play experience, how have you managed conflicts with your direct reports? I'd like to start with um, counseling, talking over the problem with the employee, um, you know, trying to work through the differences that we have and, and figure out what the root of the problem is and solve that problem. Um, if it does, if that doesn't work, then you take a stronger hand say you give a little more supervision and you just go progressively up the ladder um, trying to work out your problems with your subordinates. In the end, um, sometimes conflicts can't be easily resolved, but if you work towards the goal and talk to your employees, um, that is one of the most important things. Communication is one of the most important things and I think a miscommunication or a lack of communication causes a lot of the problems with Lisa, give us an example of when you have creatively solved a problem for your community. You know, when we got these questions last night, I was reacting my brain, trying to come up with something um, to say. And I was driving up here, and I was on the phone calling all these different people going, this is a question, and I don't know how to answer it. <laughs> and I actually have two examples, um, thanks to my friends. One of, the, one of the problems was uh, we're in the midst of doing a sewer upgrade at the village of Williamsburg, and in phase two of my upgrade, uh, we were building a new UV disinfection building, and it's within a floodplain. And our sewer plant is levy, which for the Army Corps of Engineers is perfectly fine, but it doesn't work that way for the USDA. They want your building to have what they call flood protection controls. We had to build those into the design because we had no idea they were going to um, need us to do that. So I called up my friend who's a certified flood plane administrator and she told me what you need to do is make a way for the water to flow through the building. It's really all you need to do. So we came up with the solution of simply putting in these louvered sections, cutting out a section of the building and putting in these louvered sections that allow the water to run through. It was a cheap design fix, it made us floodplain compliant, and we could move on with the project for a very little cost, additional cost. The other idea, or the other situation that we came up with, when I worked at the Kenton County Detention Center, um, during the Christmas season, obviously, the inmates tend to be a little bit more uh, depressed and, and you know, need something to distract them. So we have a cell decorating contest. And uh, you give them things like, you'd be amazed what you can do with paper plates, cotton balls, crayons, paper. Um, they would decorate their cells and we would have a, a panel of community leaders, uh, ministers, they had a priest, a minister, um, they came through, judged the cells, and the cells that won got to eat food from outside, which is also a really big thing <laughs> with inmates. And uh, that really alleviated a lot of the uh, depression that goes along with the, the holiday season in a facility like that. And it, it was a cheap fix, it, it had it let them be creative and decorate their cells and feel a little bit more holiday season during that time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your prepared questions. Uh, we now have time uh, to ask uh, Patty some more spontaneous questions. We're going to uh, send our runners out now. Uh, they will go through the audience with numbered cards. The deck was shuffled, and each runner has an assortment. This will hopefully provide better opportunity to ask questions across the audience, so we won't have everything all clustered on one side, for example. So please raise your hand, and the runners will uh, 
uh, bring you a number. There are some guidelines to consider. And don't worry, this is not charged against your time. I'm like a soccer referee. I'll we'll get it back to you at the end of the act. Some guidelines to consider. First, please keep to questions that are general in nature. Questions that require very detailed, specific answers, or that require specific recommendations, also tend to require background information, a chance to become educated, and time for synthesis. That goes beyond the scope of our forum tonight. So please, please, please keep those questions general. Finally, please keep in mind that we have the opportunity to meet the candidates in the cookie reception later tonight. That is the most appropriate venue to share your comments. So please, this time is for questions, and please, general questions. All right, so do we have a number one in the audience? I see that all the cards weren't passed out, so we're just going to have to go down the line here. All right. Well, who thinks they have a low number? This is fun. <laughs> number two. Very good. All right. Now, for your comfort and for sound, I'm going to hold one. All right? Okay. My name is Harvey Page. Uh, I had to reach out to my question and address some of the requirements. Uh, in encouraging businesses or encouraging institutions such as Antioch College, uh, there are sometimes conflicts between the village and the business side of college. Um, uh, how, how do you see the manager's role at resolving those conflicts without First of all, I don't think that there's any problem that can't be solved. And I think the way to do that goes again back to what I said about conflicts with direct reports, communication. Um, it's been my experience that if you talk to people individually and you get both sides of the story and then you bring those people together in the same room, that you're more likely to get a better result. And you may have to work at it and you may have to have several meetings and it may take you a very long time, but if you keep working at it and talking to people, you can eventually come to a solution that is acceptable to everyone. And, it, and it, communication, in my mind, is to do that. So I would be communicating with people on both sides of that. I would be communicating with the college. I would be communicating with the citizens of the council and trying to find common ground that will make, make the solution work. Thank you. If you can state your name and then your question. My name is Chrissy Cruz. I'm going to go back to the second question. How would you think about the economic viability of the village? In Yellow Springs, we have some strong uh, faith economically. We built from within recently in the past. How would you promote economic viability within the village without going outside to say the date? Like, how would you promote the viability of the village and the businesses that are already here or the You have to start with asking the businesses what they need. Um, you have to understand what their what their needs are and what you can do to help. I believe that you have a, a you have a chamber of commerce, which would be a good starting point. And um, I think that if you work through the chamber to talk to the business owners, um, just you know, walk down the street. What I do in Williamsburg is I walk down the street, I go into the, to the stores and I ask them, how's it going, and, you know, what can I do to help you? A lot of times there's not something I can do to help, but sometimes there is. And, and even if that's making it, hooking the business owner up with another resource that they're not aware of, that I happen to know about, that would help the business owner. You know, looking for some type of a business support service that they might need that you know would help them at a low cost. You know, anything that I can do to help that would, I would work towards. And I think that talking to the business owners and finding out what they need to, to help them become 
more economically viable, I think that's the starting point. It's understanding what you need. Thank you very much. I see that Pat has a number six. Does anybody have a four or a five? We're calling for a four or a five right now. Oh, oh. Yeah, that four or a five. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, I am Pat Louise. and I just know if Williamsburg was a member, is a member of a multi-agency regional drug task force. And if not, why not? And if so, what would you see as pros and cons of that kind of law enforcement approach? The answer is kind of twofold. Um, there, there is a county drug task force in Claremont County, and we do participate in that. And in fact, um, when one of their officers retired, we actually hired him as an auxiliary to come in and do the same thing with Williamsburg. So um, we do work with them on a regular basis. I see the pros in that being the fact that eventually an undercover officer is going to be identified and not be effective. Um, I think that if there is a con to that, it would be that you may lose some control over it. But I think that the interdepartmental cooperation that you would get would be very effective, and I think that it would probably be worth at least examining the possibility to, to do that, because it, the resources would just be so much more expensive in a regional coalition than what you could rely on a small scale as a village. Do we have eight or nine or 10? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think in your resume it indicates that you live in a different community in Williamsburg. I do. And I wanted to ask um, why that is, and would you plan to live in Yellow Springs? Um, yes, I would plan to live in Yellow Springs. I live in a different community uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, it was where we lived when I took the job, and Williamsburg does not have a residency requirement. And it just, at the time, wasn't. We talked about moving to Williamsburg, but it was not, um, I guess, economically feasible for us at the time. Uh, and I live about, it's 14 miles from my driveway to the, to the office. So I can be there relatively quickly. Um, but yes, I would move to, to Yellow Springs. Um, it's, it, I think it's a great community. I, I, I came here last night, I came up early, and after the rain, I was walking around, I got soaked. But uh, it, I really like walking in the cases. So, uh, does that answer the question? You were number nine, is that right? Is there a 10, 11, 12, something in the early teens, maybe? Anybody have a number? 16. 16? Anybody? Yes, absolutely. Yes. 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 We have any less than 16? Okay. My name is Ted Huber. Describe your management style. You're supervising your work with staff. Um, that doesn't suit you. Describe the highlights of the process you follow in working with the finance officer and draft your budget. Okay. <laughs> How about I just answer both of them? I would like to say that my management style is participative. And the reason that I say that is because I think that the people who know the job best are the people who do it every day. And I think that they're the most valuable resource that this community has. Because the ins and outs of the behind the scenes of the village can be very complicated. And the key to keeping it running well is to have knowledgeable people in the right position. And I think you have that here. I really do from the people that I met today. Um, that said, in the end, at the end of the day, the decision would be mine, and I would take the responsibility for it. Now I'll go on to your budget question. When I worked at the Kenton County Detention Center, it was my responsibility to develop and administer the budget um, for the jail. Um, if you don't know anything about a jail, it's like running a small city. You provide food, you provide health care, you provide every service that there is, and it's a fairly complicated budget. And I did that for seven and a half years. Um, 
and was pretty successful at it. So I would love to work with Melissa working on the budget here in the village because I think that she's she's young and I think she's very knowledgeable about what she does. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Do we have 16 and 17 and above? Wonderful. I'm Sylvia Carter. Um, given this unprecedented flood that we have now, I heard that the basement downtown buildings were desperately needing help extricating themselves from this clearly turning into a bad moment situation. So my question is to what kind of creative resources would you mobilize to deal with this kind of thing? Normally in a situation like that, um, the, the first people you call is the fire department. And the reason that you call the fire department is because they have the pumps that you use to, to pump out basements and, and remove water. Um, and I'm sure last night that they were very busy with down trees and pumping out people's basements. Um, but that would be the first route that I would call. If you have to be sometimes careful about using government resources on private property. But if there was something that I felt that we could do and that it would be appropriate, I would not hesitate to uh, to send any crew out to help a citizen who needed it. Um, the, the problem would be everybody down there has a basement that's flooded, so who do you have? Who do you hold first? And how long do you work at that before you have to take your resources and put them elsewhere? You know, and that's that's the problem that you run into is if you help one person, you have to commit to helping all of them. In the same manner. But there would be other agencies that could help, a fire department or uh, perhaps a volunteer group that has the, the right equipment to come in and help you. There's the Red Cross, there's FEMA, you know, there are all different kinds of people who can come in and help if the situation calls for it. Does that, does that answer your questions? Do you have more? <coughs> the idea of mobilizing the community to help out to do it because I think people want to help out mm -hmm. and they don't want to do it. Yeah. And there are professional people on the who know all about these kinds of things. Right. And they can do that kind of, that kind of information. So that's what I'm talking about. Did, did everyone hear that? No. No? Do you want to have a chance to re react to that? I think I did. I did. <laughs> well, I think we can move on. Let's, let's, that was just, she was just adding uh, to that question of different people that are available for, for that, that we can call them for that help. All right, any other questions? What's our time on? We're doing fine. We, uh, we have another uh, five minutes. We will ask questions to the end of your 30, uh, 30 minutes. So if you have a second question, you're welcome to add, ask that. Uh, my name is Susan Alberta, and I wonder how Williamsburg might compare with Yellow Springs in terms of the involvement of the citizens in um, uh, decisions that need to be made or wanting to, to participate, have input. Um, and if you have had um, a lot of experience with that kind of involved population, and if not, would you be looking forward to that? <laughs> <laughs> um, Williamsburg citizens tend to get involved after a decision has been made, <laughs> <laughs> which makes it a little more difficult. <laughs> but in answer to the second half of that, I, and this is something I touched on during my council interview. I actually think that the more people involved from the beginning and the more points of view that you have, the better the greater the result is going to be. And I know that sometimes it can complicate the process and make it a little more time consuming. But if you're working towards the end result, it is going to be better than you need to go through the process. So, yeah, I would probably be looking forward to that. It actually, in some instances, can make my job a lot easier. 
can make it a lot more difficult, but it can make it easier too. We still have time for at least a couple more questions. I have to admit that I, I, I do recycle, I do care about the environment, I, I try to be as environmentally friendly as I can. I have to admit that I'm probably not as well versed in things like organic foods as most of the people in this room probably are. Um, you know, I think that it's important, I think it's an important lifestyle for people who choose it, and I think it should be available. I have, actually have a friend who owns an organic farm. Um, Sustainable energy, I think, is extremely important. I actually, a couple of years ago, added sections to the village zoning code for wind and solar energy that had not been in there before. But I think it's important to start expanding those things and that people have the opportunity to do that um, within the zoning code if that's what they choose to do. Um, I, I don't know how to answer your question other than to say, since I don't have as much experience with it, I would probably have to get up to speed on learning about it, and then I would be better able to form those goals. Unfortunately, I don't have a better answer than that at this time. Hi, my name is Matthew Kirk. I'm a relatively new building president. And I was curious, um, what do you consider to be the most important attributes of a strong village? Of a strong village? The citizenry, uh, obviously, uh, and I think that because you have an active citizenry, that makes you a strong village. Um, I think that the people who work for you need to be the right people in the right positions, and I think that uh, if you have clear a clear vision and a clear goal for where you want the village to go, and you work towards that, that eventually you're going to get there. And um, I think that that's, that's important is that you have that goal in mind and it's a clear goal for everyone involved to understand. And I, I wanted to get into that. Um, okay, we have this for our last question before our time runs out. Please state your name. My name is Sharon Perry. I live here in the village. My question to you is, in Williamsburg, <coughs> Do you, are there a lot of black families or are there black families that um, you've worked with? And if so, um, are they, as far as living in Williamsburg, are they declining and leaving because of what? Williamsburg does have some black families, um, probably not as many as Yellow Springs, um, but that's predominant throughout Vermont County. They're, I don't really think that our pop the black population is in flux. Um, the, the families that, have been, that are there have been there for a while. Um, there haven't been any new families move in. Um, although they are, I will take that back, there are a couple of families that uh, just moved into the development that is up on the east side of town. And um, so it just doesn't change much in Claremont County, it, it, unfortunately. It, it just kind of is what it is. Um, this makes this uh, concludes the balance of your time. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you very yes. much.
Bachelor of Arts from Kent State University. At the age of 23 years old, I decided I wanted to get into politics, so I ran for the office of the Carroll County Commission in the northern part of the Appalachian uh, region of Southeast Ohio. And uh, somehow I won by 189 votes in 1976. I stayed there for two terms of stock re-election in 1980 and uh, got 77% of the vote uh, in, in the general election. There's a story behind that, which if I get the position, I'll tell you how to work with 77%. Came about, but nonetheless, I'll tell you that it involved finding geophones, along with my two other county commissioners. Uh, after the Two terms for up as commissioner, I was a secure job in the Ohio Department of Development in Columbus and worked there for approximately two years. Working on a number of various projects, such as a uh, project in uh, Cincinnati with General Electric's engine park, park park, uh, Ford Motors, Honda, Marysville, and some other small projects throughout the state. My family, my mother and brother and sisters were still up in Northeast Ohio and I wanted to gravitate up toward Northeast Ohio and back home, so to speak. So I applied for a job in a little town called Whitman, Ohio, which is about 50 miles south of Cleveland, about an hour away from my mother, so I knew she wasn't going to just walk in and have a lunch with me or dinner in particular day. So I secured that position in 1987. There are a variety of projects there which are highlighted in my resume and I won't bore you with them, but I would say completely rebuilt the community during my 19 and a half years there. And as Ken can testify, 19 and a half years in this business is uh, during plus four lifetimes, I would think. <clears throat> Once that, uh, I decided in uh, 2006 that we wanted to start gravitating toward Florida, so I applied for a couple of positions and was successful in securing the first full-time manager's job in a small coastal community called Souls Point. I was there for approximately seven years and uh, due to a change in commission and council, they were moving in another, another direction and uh, I was relieved my news. However, after the fire of me, uh, they asked me to keep stay on until for three months so that uh, they can find me a replacement. So that would give you an indication of what my character and integrity is like. Uh, I've been asking, that's our program. And I think Doug and Ken can probably tell you that. Uh, any time that there's been a fire I've been involved in, I take the police chief, have him go to the individual's office, clean his office out an hour, and he's not going to be on the premises anymore. So that's, uh, that's that. Uh, some of the things that I did in uh, Carroll County was develop the first sanitary sewer project. We developed the first industrial park. As I said earlier, we completely built Whitman, new fire station, EMS facility, safety service building, uh, waste $12 million, $6 million wastewater treatment facility, and uh, rehabilitated the water system, a uh, water plant while I was there. I would say that most significant thing I'm proud of during my career and my whole for that matter is that uh, the construction of the preparation center. And one of the questions, uh, if you had the last one, I'll give you a little bit more detail about how I solved the problem. That being said, uh, I think I'll probably uh, get the questions and go from here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Please tell us how you plan to be an active part of our community. Thank you, Brian. I believe it's extremely important that the manager be visible to the stakeholders of town. I've been involved in a number of civic organizations wherever I've been, whether it be Rotary Lands Club, I served on the United Way Board, uh, served on the uh, Habitat Communities, participated in the street fair events that they had that the chamber sponsored. 
and uh, just was really around and available and accessible. Uh, 19 and a half years in uh, Redmond, I got to know everybody in town. <coughs> it wouldn't be unusual for folks to come up my driveway and run to my door on Sunday afternoon and say, I got a problem, you can help me with it. And I would say certain and it took uh, somebody from the service department or somebody from the utilities department to address the situation. I called the director and uh, he would take care of it and said, look, I'm going to play it out and fix it. Uh, so I plan on being very visible in the community and very active. Uh, I don't have any kids anymore playing baseball or uh, basketball or whatever it is. So I think the coaching days are over. And, Although I had a lot of fun, uh, we weren't very successful uh, when we coached my teams. <laughs> so. Thank you. Mr. Kellogg, how would you promote the economic viability of the village? Well, here's a couple of things I've been doing that I think will be successful. Is I haven't been to Yellow Springs since the mid-1970s when I was still in college until I came back weeks ago for the first interview. I can tell you that I was shocked wouldn't be the word, but I was extremely taken back by the liveliness and vitality of the downtown. I Saturday afternoon at two o'clock, there were several people here. There wasn't a bike race going on, there wasn't a street fair. It was just you know, it was just a busy hunt. And uh, so I think who's ever organized in those events has done a marvelous job of marketing the town. And I would want the town to work in conjunction with those folks to ensure that those things continue to uh, make the downtown work successful. I didn't see a storefront that wasn't uh, full. Uh, I, I would think that maybe on the further scale, we may want to put a tax force team together of a banker, a local business person like Glenn. Uh, the right uh, to uh, work with businesses we're trying to attract here and let them uh, tell the respective people about their success stories and Thank you. I must feel like this uh, mm -hmm. room's going to be ignored. I'll throw you a curveball on me over here. A <laughs> curveball? I'm not very good at getting curveballs. <laughs> The number of black families in Yellow Springs is, is declining. How would you encourage engagement from people of color in our community? Well, Brian, I think you've got to go bigger than that. I, I think that the town, and I think this goes along with the second the next question, is I think we have to encourage all non-Caucasian nationalities to Yellow Springs, whether it's Japanese, Chinese, Koreans, uh, Latinos. I think that we have to encourage that. One of the things I would ask the council to do, if I'm selected, is that we establish a goal of over the next five years, possibly hiring maybe 25 or 50 percent of our uh, workforce to be hired, be of uh, some, some, something other than uh, Caucasians. So that's one thing we do. The other thing is that. Obviously, if they're leaving, there has to be a problem. So I would want to try to engage those folks and ask them what the problem is. Is the lack of having a dentist of uh, your color? Is it lack of having a doctor? Is it a lack of having an accountant or attorney to represent you? So that's what I would do is to try, that, try to find out exactly why they left the consumer meeting so we can address it that way. Thank you. The social economic diversity is a community goal. How will you address the, the associated challenges? Well, I, I took that as being very similar to the question that was uh, before that, and so I would be repetitive. I uh, said anything I just might add. I know that affordable housing here is uh, one of the important issues to the forefront of the community, and I think we would have to focus on considering some kind of affordable housing. You know, whether that means the town buying up lots or houses that are in foreclosure, I think that and having rehab and selling them out of Redmond, or going to the university and see if we can pry away some of that uh, small chunk of land, five or six acres, and maybe put a 
put some cluster homes, portable cluster homes in there for those folks. How have you managed conflicts with your direct reports? Well, I thought about that question when I got it. And if you've done a background check on me, um, Brian and uh, some of the elected officials, uh, I'm sure you'll find out that I was very well respected by virtually all of my staff. I would say that I only had one problem, and that was when I first went to work with the utility director. He had became, during the Floyd transition, he, he became the de facto uh, city manager. And they were under findings and findings of orders to uh, build a new wastewater treatment plant because they were compliance and the old plant wasn't going to get them in compliance. So he convinced the council without doing any financial analysis or how we're going to get the money to pay for it, convinced council to spend five hundred thousand dollars to start the design of the wastewater treatment. So when I got there, uh, there was tension in me because I tried to get a reasonable explanation for why I did this and I wasn't satisfied with the answer. Coming out of the fact that uh, there was undermining taking place by him and the council members and I being uh, trust down by the council on a couple of occasions. And so I just approached him and said, listen there, I said, this isn't working. I can't have this taking place. So I'm going to make you, Mr. Rickett, he had 18 months to go before he had to make security attention. So I marginalized him. I took him out, made him to I kept, kept his pay the same, and promoted the uh, actor, I'm sorry, the assistant, the utilities director. And in 18 months, 17 months, he came to me and said, I think next month I'm going to. So that's <coughs> that. And during my career, that's really probably the only problem we ever had for had with direct reports to me. Thank you. For those of you that came in a little later, these six questions, and we're at the last questions, these were asked by community members um, in the Dropbox and on Facebook and, and um, emails that have come through. So, Robert, the last question. Give an example of when you have creatively solved a problem for the community you work for. Well, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that I think is the high, I consider the highlight of my career is that uh, we were successful in building a recreation center in the river. And that was five years of my life that I put a lot of blood and sweat and believe it or not tears into to see that project come to reality. When we first brought the subject up with the council, uh, they were very supportive of it, but they had one caveat. And they said, we're not raising any taxes to be the trucks. And we had done an analysis and we felt that it would pay for itself from user fees and other contracts that we could be able to secure with uh, Opportunities for using the swimming pool like for uh, their swimming team practice and those kind of things. But they told me that we're under raise taxes. So we got around how to do it, and back in 1967, the town had passed a half percent income tax to fund an upgrade to the water system. During the course of those years, that fund had increased to about twice what was actually needed to pay the debt servicing and that way. So I got a look at the numbers, and uh, the numbers would, the excess money would pay for the debt service when they were in the Ration Center. So I went to council, explained the situation to them. They agreed to put on, they wouldn't change it themselves because they couldn't. Was in excess of one percent, so we had to go to the ballot. And what we decided to do was go to the ballot and bifurcate that half percent with part of going to the waterfront and the other half going to the recreation center. 
So effectively, each enemy or fund was getting a quarter percent of that uh, half percent. If that makes sense. <laughs> uh, it successfully passed. We may be in construction on it. And as I said, it's become the focal point of the community. There's a lot of activity that takes place up there with youngsters, senior students, uh, a great, great weight room. Uh, I couldn't be happier with that. Um, and maybe I'll get a shot to do something like that so before I leave the illustration. <laughs> Mr. Kellogg, this is the part, of course, where we send our runners out to the audience with some numbers so they have a chance uh, to ask you some questions. So just like before, please raise your hand if you're interested in asking a question, and uh, we'll get some cards to you very quickly. We're passing out the red number cards. We also ask that you, that you have a little bit of patience, because if, if you want to ask the same question again to the, a different, this different candidate, please feel free to do that in the audience. Just have a little bit of patience so that you can compare the answers. Before we begin, are there any other interested folks who would like to get a card? All right. So we have about uh, 13 minutes left in your time. Who has number one or something close to them? Yes, ma'am. Please wait for Jaylen with the microphone so the folks at home and everyone else here can hear. Thank you. Thank you. This will be up. Um, very near and dear to my heart, and I've seen it see more people around here than just is our planet and how we as a village respond to the needs of the planet. Uh, I would ask you what your what your experience has been in moving a village along in efforts to create sustainable. We have three support uh, agriculture. Uh, it's a little too close to I know. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, we support an agriculture we have uh, straw bale houses. We at this very same time are talking about energy efficient houses at another venue. Um, we have solar power. Uh, we did in, 19, in 2012, we put in 26 solar panels on our house. We, every moment that the sun is out, and even when it's not out, all this solar power is being given back into the grid. We like that. We do not like that. We think it's a great, great opportunity to give back to our community. We find that, unfortunately, we're being really penalized by that, by our taxes going up, because that's an improvement. We give all that money back into the grid, all that free, clean energy. This is not an encouragement to, to become sustainable. That's a very upsetting thing to me. We have a question. What have you done outside of priority group? Has it ever been a priority to you? And how have you what would you do to become this as an educational uh, uh, project that would equal the attention that we give to the arts, all the great ideas in the arts and business in this community? Thank you. Well, do I have any experience in uh, green, so to speak, uh, technology? Uh, we were just in the process of uh, revising to go green uh, just as I was leaving. Obviously, we did the recycling uh, effort with cans, bottles, uh, plastics, and those kind of things, just like you folks do here. Um, we, water quality in Florida is a very, very touchy subject. It's a, it's a very big issue. And uh, we instituted one of the second fertilizer restriction ordinances in the state of Florida uh, five years ago, prohibiting uh, land application by commercial uh, fertilizer companies on lawns during hurricane season, which is June through November. Uh, it had to be, uh, if it was applied in the past, it had to be uh, slow, slower grades, it couldn't be any more than 50 feet from the shoreline. Um, we were successful in securing a uh, $3.2 million grant for, from FEMA to elevate houses that had had repetitive floods that were in the floodplain. And 
those who just about complete now. As you, I'm sure, have read over the last couple of weeks, there's estimates that in the next 50 years, the water table in Florida is going to rise three feet. And uh, some of those properties down there that are on the water are going to be underwater, so to speak. Uh, so we've worked to try to address that by securing uh, money from FEMA to elevate those houses during uh, the high flood zone. Uh, there is an individual in town who offered to uh, donate solar panels to us for um, running the town hall, and I don't, I, that happened uh, shortly after I left, and I don't know where that stands. So, I hope that answers some of your questions. I know that you have screen, I think. Is there anybody off this line? Uh, 
uh, in the past and at present and likely in the future, uh, business organizations and uh, college uh, have uh, had conflicts with uh, citizens. Uh, what do you think the role of the village manager by implication of the council could be in those uh, kinds of conflicts? Can you give me an example? Well, one of the things we've asked is to keep it general and not use some specifics. Well, I guess my answer to the question is there may or may not be a role for the town. Um, if there's a conflict between individual property owners and, and such like that, the town's a process for uh, mediation that that can be addressed. If there's a conflict between a business being on pretty close to a residential area and noise is a factor or something like that in certain residents in the area. And again, sure, I think that's something that the town ought to consider being involved with and in trying to address the situation with property owner and business owner. Okay, we have about three minutes left. This may be our last question. We'll see. Um, was it you have before? Louise, we're an aging uh, village and many small towns that describe many small towns, but we have an even higher percentage than many other small towns of seniors, many of them somewhat affluent, but still on fixed income. So when you look at that picture, what do you anticipate in terms of questions about challenges for you as a village manager? Well, I think the new 60 now is only about 45 years in, so that's what so if you're 60 years old, you're actually 45, so you're going to live another 60 years longer than what you anticipated. So if you were to kick it to 70 or 85, that's good for you. But anyhow, um, that is a, that's a concern. And I think it has to be a concern of not only the council, but everybody in this town, because if you do, don't do something to bring some additional people in here and replace those empty nesters or older folks, and you're going to have a uh, decline in revenue source in virtually everything you do. And what that means is that one or two things are going to happen. Either property owners in town are going to have to decide whether they want to increase their taxes or there's going to be a reduction in service. And so it's very important that we try to get new people here, uh, younger folks or families, to continue to have the town prosper and grow. As we get for our last question, please keep in mind whoever is asking to keep it brief. Mr. Pella does not have much more time. Can you say your name? Well, I'm still on the clock, right? You are. I don't get five more minutes. Nope. Over here. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Mary Pella. I'm the Assistant Village Manager of Rittman. Some 80 Until you went to Sewell's Point, I'm going to go 6. That was 19 year tenure. I was thinking it would have to be exact to the day. Okay. <coughs> you show Schools Point as a small scale residential community. What was the challenge that caused you to leave Richmond for Schools Point in Florida? And the second part of it is you are now coming to Yellow Springs, which certainly represents a much broader, stronger challenge. One of them is that we have an extremely high turnover of village managers, often cited as a poor fit. So, what was your challenge to go to Florida, and what do you see as your challenge to come to Yellowstone? Well, I've been in Ohio for two and a half years. Um, I probably. Can you hear him over there? After being in Ohio for two and a half years. In retrospect, I probably stayed too long in Britain. Um, I should have probably left it for five or six years, but it wasn't that simple of, 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 of leaving. My family was an hour to the east, my wife's family was an hour to the west, and we really felt comfortable in this kind of small town we were in because we really grew up in small towns, and small town values, just like Yellow Springs has, and wanted to raise our kids in a small town. Um, the reason I ended up leaving with me is that there was a change in council. And it became very apparent that when my contract was up, it was not going to be renewed. I 
And so I started looking around. I interviewed for a couple jobs in some other places in Ohio. And uh, then I decided I uh, wanted to go to Florida. And I uh, was lucky enough to stay a job in Souls Point, become their first full time manager uh, back in September of 2006. Um, I did some things at Souls Point that I had never imagined. A town manager would do. And we became very focused on customer service. Uh, it would not be unusual for me to get a call from a resident saying, I have to take my cousin, cousin James to the doctor and I can't get him in the car. Can you send an officer down and help put him in the car? Of course we would. I had a call from an 80 year old guy on me and he said that his battery was a uh, smoke tech was out and was going beep, 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 beep. It was 20 foot up in the air up in the ceiling. And he said, you can get out and fix it. I said, you have a ladder? He said, sure. I go down, go on the ladder, go 20 feet to get the uh, uh, battery out, and place it, and it's good to go. So those are the kind of things that we really focused on when we were in town. I'm on a roll now, so don't stop. He recognizes the law. Thank you so very much. So, growing 
growing up, I have lots of great memories of learning about to my like, young students and the ice cream. Uh, how you can in the in, uh, Clint Allen and the different places there. And then later in life, um, coming back from my family to, uh, to enjoy the same things. Uh, I became a TP as a young man, which was pretty cool. And uh, I've come to see a number of really good bands at uh, Peaches. So, um, why am I interested in this position when I saw that whole uh, Not only was it, I thought, a great uh, career opportunity, but I also think, based on my experience, that this would be a great place to live and eventually bring my family to and, and live here. So um, that's, that's my, my bio, I guess, in a quick nutshell. Well, let's ask, let's, let's expand on that a little bit more. Tell us how you plan to be an active part of this community. Yeah, that's a great question because um, I'll share with you a quick story. During the interview process, one of the uh, members of the advisory committee, uh, who introduced themselves, uh, said that um, uh, the village of Yellow Springs is not just a village, it's a life way of life. And that, that resonated with me, and I thought that, that sounded important. And it's clearly, to me, quite, uh, quite evident that uh, based on the amenities and the, and the, uh, the, the, the resources and the amount of uh, volunteerism and uh, nonprofit associations that are here, that uh, this village to me is a, is a genuine, authentic village. In fact, it, 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 to me, uh, I describe it as, as overwhelming at times. Uh, I mean, it's a village that uh, offers um, as much, if not more, in some communities, twice or three or four times bigger uh, than it is. But, so, to answer the question, um, I thought to myself, uh, if I'm going to be a member of this community, how will I live? How will I be active in the community? And so what I did is I put together um, sort of a little to-do list, a little checklist, and again, I can, I can share this with, with people uh, later if you want to copy. I call it I Live Yellow Springs. And so I thought to myself, uh, it, uh, is that if I'm going to demonstrate not only my commitment to the community as a village manager, but I also want to demonstrate it as a committed citizen. So, it's a checklist, it's a monthly to-do list, if you will, and it includes things such as attended and participated in local public activities. Check that off. I would probably most certainly be doing that as the, as the, uh, as the village administrator. Uh, but also uh, things such as um, participating in charitable events, contributing monies, uh, going to the uh, farmer's market, uh, patronized or um, uh, uh, going to the local store and um, bringing friends in from out of town. Uh, so in my list is you know, 30, 40 different ways of how I would, would try to contribute to the community in a very uh, active way. Thank you. How would you promote economic viability? Yeah, that's a good question. I knew that one would come up. I, um, I read all of Diane's uh, eight uh, uh, sections, sections on economic development, 45 pages <laughs> of material. And uh, I, I certainly, it, it is a, obviously, it's a very important topic uh, to the community. And so, but economic vitality means a lot. A lot of different things to a lot of different people, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different businesses. So, economic vitality for a large business is very different than economic vitality for a for small business. And so, in order to focus the conversation on what's really important to each uh, uh, organization, each business that's in the community. I, again, I put together a um, sort of a, uh, a little outline of 
and the different aspects of economic development. Most people think about economic development from a government perspective as providing some sort of subsidy, some sort of tax break, something along those lines. And the reality is for most small businesses, that's not really what they're looking for. What they're looking for is information, resources, the ability to network with, uh, uh, with other businesses in the community to become a viable, uh, sustainable, long-term partner in, in the community. And so what I did, it's in here somewhere, I put together a checklist uh, approximately 19, 20 different things that I would go to the business community and sit down and have a conversation and say, what is it that you need? How can I help you uh, in, in your, in your, uh, your long-term uh, success in, in the community? Is it that you need help with planning or zoning? Um, is, it, is it that you need help with infrastructure? Uh, is it uh, help that you need with marketing and promotion? So there's a whole gamut of different things about what economic development means to organizations. And on that checklist, next to them, I put uh, together a list of providers that can help in that process. Uh, for example, um, if an organization is looking to try to market themselves, Chamber of Commerce is a great place to, 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 to be a partner if somebody is looking to recruit uh, and attract high quality employees, your universities, your professional trade associations, your vocational schools, those are great resources. So I see the role of the village manager um, in helping make those connections, help facilitate that, that, that dialogue, and uh, really helping each individual business you know, customize the development strategy for their specific needs. Thank you. I'm assuming that you'll have those those charts and checklists available <laughs> if people want to see them at the meet and greet with you. Sure. Uh, yes. So don't don't be afraid to ask. Them. <laughs> the third question that came from our community collection of, of questions is the number of black families in Yellow Springs is declining. How would you encourage engagement from all people of color in our community? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question, and I think I think to, to, to answer as succinctly as possible is that if there is any group of individuals in the community that, uh, for whatever reason, feel feel disenfranchised. Or not receiving the, uh, the value or the benefit or the service that they expect out of the community. Uh, it's important to not be passive about it, but to reach out to that community and again, sit down with those individuals and say, just to sort of have, you know, sort of start with a basic conversation. What is it about Yellow Springs or about the region that's, that's missing or that you would like to see uh, cultivated or grow or succeed or eliminated. <laughs> There's a problem for that. And it's the same, you sort of apply the same methodology that you do with sort of the economic development strategy. And that is, you know, that it, 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 it's the, um, it, uh, it, it is black families in the community and they have to identify the specific item that they're missing from the community. It's, it's, it's something that they're moving someplace else to, to, to receive. Let's find that. Let's see if we can't bring it to Yellow Springs. Let's see if we can't make it successful. Uh, again, I'm, 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 I'm completely overwhelmed by the number of nonprofit associations <laughs> that are in this community. And a lot of them are very nonprofit or very community oriented. And um, I, I, I recall it. Uh, group called 365 Project, um, and so that would be a, a resource to go to to talk about uh, what, what options and advantages there are. Um, you know, again, whatever the, whatever the uh, group, whatever the entity is again, about trying to network and connect them with what it is that they really want. So, 
socioeconomic diversity is also a community goal. How will you address the associated challenges? Yeah, that's, I'm glad that was asked too, because I'll share with you a direct example of an experience that I had with the Pierce Township. Um, and again, I'll try to keep it succinct. Um, a, uh, a, a, a golf course that is up and coming and growing new investors trying to put in new money to, to really make it a premier golf course uh, was uh, directly, um, uh, the course was directly adjacent to uh, a, um, an older, larger, sort of family apartment complex. And without going into the specific details, there were, there were, there were socioeconomic differences that existed. And unfortunately, it would often result in calls to the police and uh, some very adversarial relationships and confrontations that occurred. Um, we felt that, again, the only way to address that was to bring all of the stakeholders, all the parties involved, bring them together, sit down, and we did two, well, the first thing we did is introduce themselves to each other. <laughs> The owners didn't know the golf course, the golf course didn't know the owners. So we said, I think it's important to have a meet and greet. And in doing so, let's tour each other's facilities. Let's show what we're proud of about our community, about our partner complex, about the golf course. And so right away, one of the things that we did was we helped cultivate and build a rapport. We helped cultivate and build a trust or an understanding that we're going to work on uh, resolving a problem that we both have agreed there, that exists uh, here. And so, how, again, what did we do? Uh, what, did, what, what did Pierce Township do to participate in that? Uh, one, uh, there was a very nasty element. Well, first of all, the apartment complex was predominantly good people. Uh, there was just a really small handful of people that were causing most of the problems. And most of it was associated with and so uh, we, and the owners were having difficulty addressing that and dealing with it. And so our officers uh, approached it in a way that we will help you with eviction processes. Uh, we're going to be polite, we're going to be kind, we're going to work with people. But if you've got a core of people that are causing a problem that don't want to participate in this community in a positive way, we will help them find another community. Not that we want to cast it off someone else, but essentially we are trying to help solve the problem. Uh, we also came to an understanding, some people didn't even know, just they didn't know property boundaries. Uh, there was a large lake that divided the two of them. It was on the golf course property, but a lot of the people in the apartment complex thought it was theirs. And so they would be fishing, swimming, and boating, and here are all the, golf, the golfers are what see the owners are what's going on. You know, they're concerned about the liability, they're concerned about the issues with that. And so we said to the to the apartment uh, owners, just send out a flyer. Let people know that that's not, you know, let's put a sign on it. And but let's find a negotiated agreement. Swimming and boating, eh, probably not, but would it be okay if people fished on it after that? And so that would give people a sense of, yeah, we're, we're cooperating and we're working together. So that's just a couple. We did a lot of other things as well uh, to help bridge what was a, uh, an apparent socioeconomic gap. Um, but I think ultimately um, we really did help bring those people together. Uh, the common thread between all everybody, regardless of your socioeconomic status, is that everybody uh, wants to be, everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to be cared for. Everybody wants to be respected. Everybody wants to be a part of the community. Everybody wants to be some, part of something uh, they want to contribute. And so rather than focusing on the differences between groups, let's focus on those core commonalities and build them. Mr. Albert, how have you managed conflicts 
with your direct reports in the past? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll share with you another, another real story that took place. Uh, we had a, a Pierce Township full service uh, police fire EMS, Chinese zoning building, code enforcement, uh, uh, all, all of what you would expect out of a full service community. Uh, we had an opening for the fire chief position. Uh, Pierce Township believed with uh, uh, about uh, promotion from within. So we provided an opportunity for captains, lieutenants, and there was an assistant chief to apply for the position. We put together a, a, an interview panel that was comprised of, uh, of fire chiefs and other people from outside of the community to, to have sort of an objective uh, opinion. Uh, they were an ad hoc committee making recommendations for the uh, trustee. Ultimately, uh, the, the group and the board decided to promote a captain over the assistant fire chief. Well, you can imagine that didn't sit very well with the, uh, with the assistant chief. And so, we kind of, and that, I mean, you know, you know, a fire department operates kind of like a paramilitary organization, and uh, there's a chain of command that's respected, and there's often an expectation that if you're the chief, assistant chief, you will receive the promotion to the fire chief. So there was a cultural issue there that we had to talk about and work through uh, when it came to just the expectations within the fire service. But more importantly, uh, when talking to the assistant chief about the reason we promoted the captain, it was never about what his, what his inadequacies or what, his, uh, what, what he couldn't do, the conversation never took place. It was about what his skills and talents were and how he could best fit into the organization and best serve the fire department and best serve uh, uh, the residents of Pierce Township. And it was a long conversation. It, it, took, it took a few weeks to, to sit down and work through that. But ultimately, uh, he realized, and uh, the, the, we had the chief involved in that, in that as well, they realized that in their capacities, uh, they made an excellent team. And I would encourage anybody to give them a call and they can tell you that story. <laughs> and so it, it came out, what could have been a very divisive uh, issue that could have caused you know, significant ripple effects in the form of morale or in service of the organization, turned out to become a very positive uh, change for them. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We have about nine minutes left uh, of your time. What we'll do now is distribute our cards again for the final time to the audience. Uh, but did Ms. Numbers know? We asked about six, yes. There was one more that I oh, really wanted to share. <laughs> the last question I oh, said. Thank you. Do you want to I don't know. Part of that uh, is a year-long program. Part of that program involves a service project for a uh, community. I hooked up with the uh, Literacy Council of Claremont and Brown County. The challenge that that organization was having was, uh, and it was an unusual one, they had more volunteers than they did clients. And so they needed help figuring out how to attract and draw more people into the program. Learn how to read. So we took a look at their um, at their marketing, and um, they had a website that was 99% text. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and, and they were advertising their services at the public library. 
And he thought, well, this is probably the reason why you're not getting people to, uh, to come. So we had to think about how we, how do we, how do we add the time to do it. But the other, the most important question was, why do people come to your organization to learn how to read? And you'd be, I was surprised to learn the, uh, the, the, the number one reason. Number one reason was that uh, when, 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 when people who didn't read, when they had children or they had grandchildren, they wanted to read books to them. My first inclination was to think they wanted employment, they wanted a job. That's on the list, that was important. But so that, um, also, um, uh, they wanted to be involved in their uh, church. Um, and and you know, being illiterate makes it difficult to do that in you know, the job. So we came up with this idea to say, rather than giving them text, let's show people what reading is all about. And let's market it in places where these people most likely are. Um, and so, uh, camping was, this is, this is the creativity artistic part, and that is we put together a poster. And uh, this, was, this was my project of the uh, group. And uh, everybody in this group is a friend or a family member, and uh, they're all willing to, to help out. And so we wanted to show people reading to their children. We wanted to show people in church. Uh, we wanted to show people on the job. That's the Moscow staff, by the way. Uh, they gussy up for the, for the picture for me. Uh, and then, you know, also too, going to the doctor. Yes, it's incredibly difficult if you don't know how to read. So uh, we wanted to show people the reasons and why you could, uh, why, what are the advantages of coming in and, and, uh, and learning to read. And we took these to uh, uh, jobs and family services workforce home, prisons, places where people are likely to be that don't know how to be. And so I wish I could tell you the follow-up story and say that it was a great success. There were a million people, but our campaign was focused on that. But I did stay in touch with the executive director of the, uh, the program. Uh, and um, I, I think she was very pleased and happy that, that we, we hit it right on that for what they were looking for. Well, I'm really glad you had a chance to answer that question. I will go home tonight and have my four-year-old help me relearn how to count to six. <laughs> <laughs> but before I do that, we have one more chance to go ahead and hand out cards. We've got about five minutes left, uh, and hopefully we can get some questions now. Uh, so we'll just get those going very quickly. We'll go ahead and start with number one. These will be the green cards green question cards that are going from the ground. Oh. oh, good. Right behind you, Jay. Oh. Let's start again. Hi. I had to hug her first. Mr. Elmer, I'm Diane Anderson. I'm one of the seniors in the village. Uh, just want to alert you that we are in the midst of an exciting and interesting rebirth of the college. It does work so well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I wonder if you thought about that at all and to what extent you would want uh, and be able to participate in that. Uh, in the university? No. I'm a college. Oh, the college. I'm sorry. The college. Oh, many opportunities for the uh, for a, a village or a local government to, to interact with the college. Uh, training and education right up front. Uh, there are opportunities for our uh, employees to learn and grow and develop at the school, like for myself. Um, there, there's, a, there's a great opportunity there. Um, uh, higher education institutions are also, uh, I mean, not only are they you know, great places for, for culture and arts and, uh, and uh, uh, lectures and opportunities for people to come together for those uh, type of events. Uh, they also indirectly uh, serve as uh, economic engines for the community. And so, um, so when working with uh, Andy Hock, I would, I would ask them the same questions that I would ask anybody else. And then 
first of all, I'm here to help. How can I help? And walk through what it is that uh, that they're looking for out of, out of their goals and missions, and uh, see if uh, their goals and missions align with the villages, and find ways to partner up. I wish I could give into more detail about that. That's a good conversation to have. Body and purpose. Yes. Well, there are any more. Any more. <laughs> so, Number two. Which will be our last question. So please, if you have questions, if you're from 4 or 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, the reception is a good place to ask that. Who has number two? You know, since my question is already sort of Okay, number three. All right. Okay. My name is Sharon. I'm going to hear you. I'm sorry. My name is Sharon Perry. And not only are black families leaving, don't, don't want to sound like that. Those are the only people leaving. A lot of families are leaving, or people, whether you're black, Caucasian, or whatever. And they're leaving the town, and it's a problem that's been going on for years. And it's because of not affordability of housing. I mean, it's just going on and on, and it's still a problem. How would you try to change that to bring affordability to Yellow Springs for living um, so that people can stay or bring new families in? How would you attack that situation that's been going on for a long time? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that there, there's, there's probably two immediate sources that I would turn to. Development community, where the development community is, uh, and the real estate community. I would turn to those people, uh, and which I'm sure both of them probably have the same concern. Uh, if you're a developer that's building something that nobody can afford, why, why don't? <laughs> I mean, they want to be able to sell something. Uh, and the same goes for real estate companies. If they're putting something on the market that is so out of reach, for the community to afford, how are they? How are they benefiting from it? So that, the conversation really starts there. Is um, what it is to find the market. Let's define uh, what opportunities there are. Let's look at what does the community want. Do they want um, uh, uh, infill opportunities. Do they want apartment or condo attached? Uh, units? Do they want uh, make mansions on 20,000 acres? So the conversation first starts with what does the community really want because affordability and style, those are all those are big, big terms that I think we all need to get on the same page with first. Once we define that, then we start working towards meeting the needs of the community. But I, I definitely see myself in it. In Village uh, being involved in facilitating uh, and, and affordable community Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Elmer. That's the balance of, of your time. I have some uh, comments for the audience, and we'll join you upstairs. And
Mental Health First Aid is an evidence-based program that's a grassroots effort that teaches community members the science and symptoms of mental illness so that they may have information about how to help people, where to direct them uh, early before uh, something develops and someone is suffering more than they should be. So that's a really worthwhile thing. $5 a ticket raffle upstairs. Thank you all very much. Thank you.